lived in Singapore until 2019, and he's now based in New Zealand. Drawing on his life experience from the military and from law enforcement, Dion worked in senior management in Singapore as a regional operations manager for a corporate acquisition. You may have met Dion at some chamber events in this role, or while he was championing veterans issues as the founder for Success for Soldiers. Now working from South, Dion is speaking to us today about how to lead with courage through a crisis, which is familiar ground, given that he consults director governments on mental health and leadership. Dion's the author of two books, The Good News About PTSD and The VIP of Mental Health. If there's ever been a time to focus on the relationship between crisis leadership and mental health, it's now. Just a bit of housekeeping. If you want to ask any questions during this session, um, there's a green Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. Um, Dion will get to all your questions at the end. So now I'll hand over to Dion. I'm fascinated to understand what we can do to manage our fear and the chaos around us while at the same time adapting our businesses to survive and benefit. Dion. Thank you, Rachel. Tihei muri ora, ko rupe hu te maunga, ko hau tapu te awa, ko ngāti tumatauinga te iwi, ko Dion Jensen ahau. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Zao an, Waldiao Dion. I was actually born in Changi in 1974, grew up swimming in the Fernleaf and down at the Terra Club in that swimming pool eating chicken fried rice. And I know it's a little bit dark and scary out there at the moment, but this is where we're at home. We're at home in crisis because of our backgrounds. And if it looks a little bit dark and shadowy, uh, that's how people are feeling at the moment. If anyone is taking notes right now, I would like you to write down three words. Think, feel, do. These are the three lanes we're going to stay in during this talk. What we're going to think about, how that makes us feel, and then what are we going to do? We have an hour today, and I'm going to share my perspective on crisis leadership, which is separate from all other types of leadership. Crisis leadership is the equivalent of a soldier during war, as opposed to a soldier in peacetime. In peacetime, the leader is all about engagement, productivity, and revenue. When it comes to war and battle, we're dealing with everything that we're dealing now. And before we get into the content of what I'm talking about, because we only have an hour, I realize that I'm talking to leaders. We have a special guest on today's webinar. We have the Honorable Delta Wong, who is the Papua New Guinea Minister of Health. And we also have Colonel Derek McMillan, who is the command at Sembawang Naval Base from my old unit, 1st Battalion Northern New Zealand Infantry Regiment. In this room, on this webinar, we are surrounded by leaders. And we all lead a different way, but in crisis, there's specific ways to lead. Because the underlying emotion that we're dealing with is fear. So there are, we don't like using the word assumptions, but we have to take some things on risk. And for this particular webinar, what I'm going to take on risk now is that everyone here has a competency in leadership and management. And everyone here, has a competency in risk assessment, specifically the hierarchy of risk control and what to do when you put a control measure in place for a risk. Because what I'm seeing at the moment is we're identifying a risk, we're putting a control measure in place. We have COVID-19 as the risk. It's not actually the risk, it's the catalyst. The risk is people with a compromised immune system can end up with pneumonia and die. So the control measure is that we close our borders and we isolate. That's the control measure. But every control measure creates another risk. And in the mental health fields that I work with, the worst thing that you can do is isolate and segregate people. So I'm going to take on board that you should know leadership and management and risk assessments, and also what a SWOT analysis is and how to conduct one. Because I'm sure that you're going to be going through this uh, on a daily basis if you're running a business. And the last thing I'm going to take on risk is that you understand that mental health is critical in crisis. If you don't believe that, you don't understand that, you are going to lose. Because no matter what we touch, whether we get to artificial intelligence, we talk about leadership, we talk about management, flesh and blood is going to touch that. 
Any procedure that you come up with, flesh and blood is going to touch that. And that person is who we have to focus on. And it's all on you. If you are the leader, if you call yourself a leader, if you take the pay as a leader, it is all on you. And I want to acknowledge that leadership is very lonely. I have led in situations where it's life and death. The decisions rest on my shoulders. There is nowhere to hide in crisis as the leader. Crisis will shine a spotlight on your skills as a leader, which amplifies fear. Aren't you glad you came on this motivational and inspiring speech? <laughs> but it's so important that I acknowledge that for the leaders. Because the leaders are sitting here like I am, with my wife and kids out walking the dog. I'm responsible for a tribe of people. I'm responsible for a business. And they're all looking at me. They're all relying on me to come up with the answers. To share what I'm thinking. To share what I'm feeling. And asking, what do I do? So as we go through this talk today, those of you that are thinking, I want you to pay attention to my perspective and think about what I'm saying. Those of you that are more emotional, understand what I'm saying, how that makes you feel. And I guarantee at one point of this conversation today, there will be a group of you on this that will go, stop talking, Dion. Tell me what to do. And I promise I will. So we've got three phases for crisis leadership to get you through this. And I will give you those steps. Crisis leadership. Crisis is a time of intense difficulty or danger. Intense. And that's actually really good news because there is a time frame. It cannot stay here forever. Win, lose, or draw, this will go all the way through. Pressure is always involved. And high pressure performers will stand up. Right now, over 22 military veterans commit suicide every day. They have done for many years because of a loss of values. But in crisis, when there's a whole lot of fear around, a lot of those soldiers are standing up. Because pressure is to a high performer what caffeine is for a lot of us in the morning. So I also have to apologize when I run crisis leadership. It's because I'm enjoying it. I enjoy crisis. I enjoy environments where there's fear and threat of death because it's familiar. And I'm not afraid because I know exactly what to do because I've done it before. So we have to acknowledge the spectrum that people feel pressure on and fear. You may be way over this side and think this is a big conspiracy and it's just a way to control people. Or you might be way on this side where you've actually lost people who have died because of COVID-19. Those are our left and right of arcs. There are those of us that does not affect at all, and there are those that are terrified. So while we're thinking, feeling, and doing, when we communicate, understand the pressure that is on people along that spectrum. And then there's always a consequence, which is why we need to understand risk assessments, likelihood and consequence, right? So if I make that really simple, when I'm called into crisis, I'm dealing with the speed, the stakes, and the scale. How fast is this happening? Because that affects my ability to make a decision. What are the stakes? Are they life and death? Or is this business? Is this money? What are the stakes? And what's the scale? Am I dealing with one company? Am I dealing with a country? Am I dealing with a region? When I was a regional operations manager for APAC, I had to deal with the entire Asia Pacific region. Every country was different. And to give you an idea and bring it to a corporate sense, before we get into the military side, I remember once when I was an undercover consultant, the state operations manager would utilize me. He put me on sites in, in oil and gas and mining. And I'd go in there as a low-level guard or a low-level admin person. And it was my job to stay there for a few weeks, have a look at all the personnel, have a look at all the procedures, identify the culture and profile. And then it was my job to report those findings back to the state operations manager. And I was always sent somewhere where something wasn't working. And in the corporate sense, it was always a lack of engagement, productivity, or revenue. And it was my job to figure out what that was. So I had flown in to this particular town. And when I got there, there was a message on my cell phone, get to the quality hotel by 3 p.m. So I jumped in a rental car. I got to the quality hotel at 3 p.m. At which stage I met the state operations manager and the HR manager. 
who gave me a management shirt and says, we are going into a meeting. I need you to catch up when we get in there. So already I know something's going on. I've been called in because something will be going wrong somewhere. So I've got my guard up, but I have a filter in crisis. And my filter is this, fear. Fear is my filter and my best friend because if you process information through that filter and you make fear your filter and fear the lens you look through, when you go into crisis and you understand what everyone fears, it's very simple to provide the solution. People in crisis, people in fear are the easiest people to lead because they have your focus. So we go into this meeting, at which stage three clients start yelling and are very angry at the state operations manager. And the situation is that the subcontractor had threatened to walk the entire workforce of 14 industrial sites in Southeast Queensland. Over $20 million worth of contracts, everyone's ready to walk out. So I'm sitting there with the state operations manager and the HR manager in the mindset of an undercover consultant who's now in a management shirt thinking that maybe there's, I'm here to make up the numbers, so there's three of us and there's three clients, and I'm there for moral support. How wrong I was. <laughs> so the answer from the state operations manager, when someone's in crisis, they want to know what to do. Never mind the thinking, never mind the feeling, what do I do? So the client said to the state operations manager, what are you going to do? And he turned around and says, it'll be fine. I've flown in Dion Jensen, he's a specialist, leader and manager, and he'll take over from now, there'll be no problem. And they all just looked at me. That was my introduction to a crisis situation in corporate where I had to hold together 14 industrial sites and $20 million worth of contracts on the spot. So the speed, fast. The stakes, very high. And the scale, 14 industrial sites, lots of people. So with my filter on, what are these clients scared of? What's their fear? Their fear is that people walk off site and they can't produce, they lose money, then they're accountable. So their fear is workers leaving and being blamed. So my answer has to alleviate those two fears. In crisis leadership, you alleviate fear. And you have to know what to do. You can't say, well, I think we should do this, or I feel the right thing to do is. You have to come up with a plan of what you are going to do. So I said, it's no problem. I know what the staff fear. They're worried if they still have a job. Is it the same pay in terms? And it's close to Christmas, does it affect their leave? I'll go and talk to them, they'll be fine. It's my plan, I take full responsibility and accountability, and if anything goes wrong, you can blame me. That stopped everything in its tracks. And then one client pushed it just a little bit further and said, we expect you to live somewhere close to the site, because I don't live in this town. So in police negotiation, if you are pressured to make a decision, you defer authority of that decision. So I said, I don't know about you, but my wife decides where we live and I will leave that decision to her. And we carried on. So long story short, we held that region together for 12 months. And for those of you that are connected on my LinkedIn, you can go to a recommendation written by a gentleman called Gordon Wilcox, who was one of the clients. And he will give you a rundown of what happened. His words were, I inherited a poison chalice and made a sterling job of it. Purely because I understood fear. I understand how fear makes people think. I understand how fear makes people feel and what they do when they're scared. So for everything that we're talking about as we go through this discussion, your relationship with fear will have a huge amount of influence on your decisions. And the outcome. So you lock down your own fear. So let me give you something to do. Right now, write down what you're scared of. On that scale, if you're not scared of anything, you've got good contracts, you've got good money, you're out there looking for other companies to buy, you're fine. Or you might be at the other end of the spectrum where I'm terrified that I'm going to catch COVID-19 and die. I'm terif uh, terrified that uh, my grandparents are going to get it, my mum's going to get it, someone's going to get it. What are you afraid of? Because the gold nugget is your people are scared of the same thing. And then you just need to know what to do about it. So let's look at the difference between military and corporate. A lot of my success has been when I came from a military background, um, all the way up to close protection in the Middle East over three years. For those of you who see my Goldcast videos, about high up the level as I could get 
live scenarios, super fast, super loud, people dying. Military, the stakes are always high. The stakes are life and death. Not in peacetime, but in conflict. There are two fundamental differences between military and corporate. One, the stakes are always life and death. But two, the military needs an enemy to function. There has to be an enemy. There has to be a target. There has to be something to attack. And so everything that we're taught in the military is how to totally deconstruct the enemy. And for those of you that heard me speak on 89.3 Money FM on The Art of War by Sun Tzu, we say Sun Tzu, but it's Sun Tzu. He says the ultimate skill as a general is to win a war without fighting the battles. And so we learn the strategy of deconstructing an enemy. And fear is fuel. Fear is a friend. So when I came from military into corporate, everything that everyone was scared of, the stakes were so much lower to me. So emotionally, it did not affect me until I started dealing with people in the corporate world who were suicidal. Depression, anxiety, pressure. So for me, stress doesn't exist. It's pressure. Now, we need a certain amount of pressure, like our blood pressure. But in business, if you're not equipped to handle a certain amount of pressure, the cracks will show. Those cracks are what people decide, uh, describe as stress. It's pressure. So the fundamental difference between military and corporate, military stakes are life and death, and we need an enemy. The difference with corporate, it's about engagement, productivity, and revenue. The stakes aren't life or death unless we get into the realms of mental illness. Not mental health, it's different. So we have to look after mental health. That's why it's a critical component of crisis leadership. So to make this really simple, I have a really simple philosophy. The river, the rock, and the eagle. Crisis is a river. If you just think, there's that word, of crisis as a river of energy, you will understand that as a leader, you need to be the rock. You need to be that safe place that people come to. And you need eagles. You need vision. You need situational awareness. You need people out there looking past what you're dealing with. Otherwise, you won't be able to regain the initiative. So we are in crisis at the moment. It is a river of energy. As leaders, we must be the rock. Fixed point. We must have eagles so that we keep our situational awareness and our strategic vision as far out as we can go. Coming back to think, feel, and do, at this stage of the discussion, who's thinking, who's feeling something, and who knows what they're going to do, or who's frustrated that they still don't know what to do yet. Through every discussion, and especially listening to other people in crisis, listen to these three words. It will tell you so much about how to lead people. If anyone says, I think we should do something, you need to have logical discussions with them. Make sense? All right, fear, my best friend, love fear, love fear. Fear is such a good friend, why? We have instant focus. Boom, COVID-19, this is going on, contact front, boom, we focus. And the body jumps a whole lot of adrenaline, we get all this energy. So right now in crisis, fear has given us focus and energy for free. But it's our attitude as leaders that will dictate the results. And there's certain skills that we can utilize with fear. It's very, very easy to motivate people that are scared. It's very, very easy to direct people who are scared because people that are scared require courage and clarity. It's all they need. They need for you to stand up and say, look, I'm not afraid. And I know exactly what to do. Where are you now? Are you safe? Do you have enough food to eat? Do you have enough money to pay for food to eat while we're locked down? And then when you do that assessment, you just tell them what to do. Vulnerability and leadership, we do not use vulnerability in crisis. That's the manager's job. If you want to be vulnerable as a manager to connect with people, great. As a leader, no. All right, and I'll have this emotional discussion afterwards. But in crisis, there's no time to be vulnerable. Vulnerability will get you hurt or killed in crisis. Right now, the big players in business are sniffing the water for blood. Any startups, any little companies, any vulnerability anywhere, they're going to go straight after like a shark after blood. You don't show vulnerability and leadership in crisis. Now, I know a lot of people think about Jacinda Ardern at the moment and how great she's doing. That's great. We'll come back to that afterwards because she's doing some fantastic things. But she's still showing strength with empathy, not vulnerability. It's a difference. So your number one skill in crisis is focus. 
If you can control focus, you control everything. If you can focus your mind and keep control of your mind, you control everything. Because who is controlling our focus at the moment? The crisis will and then media will. And the focus that media has is focusing on the fear to amplify it to keep everybody's focus. As the leader, you are there to say, look at me. I know it's there. Don't look at them. Look at me. This is what we are going to do. Go there. Do this. And every time there's an update, COVID-19, 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 the focus shifts straight back to that crisis river again. And the classic one for anyone that's watching uh, TV in New Zealand, and I normally do not watch TV in New Zealand, but I'm watching because I want to see how media is controlling focus. And the classic one is <clears throat> there's a news reporter. And New Zealand Parliament, like the rest of New Zealand, is a ghost town. Is it? No, lady. Parliament is empty, like it is in the weekend and at night. And New Zealand's not a ghost town, everyone's at home with teddy bears in their windows. Uh, if anything, New Zealand's on a long weekend. But they have to report in a way that takes the focus back to fear so that they can control. So let's look at control, influence, and manipulation. Control comes from credibility and trust, right? Influence, more so. Manipulation, through fear. So who used to have the most power as far as influence goes or control? It used to be mainstream media. And then social media was almost at the point where we pay more attention to what's being said on social media to what we do to mainstream media. But now with this crisis, and this is what Jacinda Ardern has done very, very well, is she's kept the focus back on government through mainstream media and social media. If you follow her Instagram feed, she keeps everyone updated on Instagram and mainstream media, and she's on the news all the time. So in New Zealand, mainstream media and government and our prime minister have our focus. But she's not linking it back to fear like some other people are doing. But if we look at Australia, it's about the fear of the economy. There's no fear of anyone dying. It's more worrying about the economy. So very interesting. All right. Here's a simple acronym. Now, if you're having problems seeing these slides, I just want to have them up here for those of you that English is your second language. This recording will be made available. I'll make this presentation available. And I've also got a couple of ebooks that you can utilize as well. But this is the acronym uh, when it comes to controlling focus. You've got to be a fixed point as a leader. You've got to bring order to chaos. And you can give orders. C3, there's three Cs. Clear, constant communication. Clear, constant communication. Your voice has to be the voice that they're listening to. It's got to be clear and it's got to be constant. Another thing that Jacinda Ardern is doing very well. Every couple of hours on the news, there's an update. It, there's always an update on Instagram. There's always an update on Twitter. It's clear, constant communication. And then people become accustomed to that voice. That's the power of influence. It's where Tony Robbins and Gary V and Brendan Burchard and all those guys control so much of the economy. Not so much the economy, they, they control so much of the social media influence and make a lot of money because they are that constant voice posting four times a day where people are more often. So where do you think the influence is right now? It's not happening in the workplace, it's on our TVs and on our phones. You have to understand, this is the you in focus, you have to understand these dominoes that you're pushing. You need to understand that everything that you say is going to have a consequence and cause and effect. Because there's a whole lot of us sitting here doing the math and a lot of things are not adding up. So if you push a domino that says we stop flights and we isolate, we all know where those other dominoes can go, economically, psychologically, and some of it doesn't stack up. So whatever decisions you make now as a leader, understand where those dominoes go based upon what your people think, feel, and doing, and are doing at the moment in regards to how they respond to this crisis and their fear. And you've got to have a strategy. We have a mission, which is part of a strategy that has three phases. There are 10 steps in each. We have a strategy. So when I'm talking to my people, they're scared of something, I acknowledge it, I bring the focus back to myself, I give an order, I bring order to, those, to that chaos, clear, constant communication, 
I understand where they're coming from and I understand the effect of my instructions because it's all part of my strategy to keep us safe and position us for the future. Here we go. This is difficult as a leader when you start. I've talked a lot about focus and how fear will take our focus, but I guess even trickier. And here's the skill in leadership. When you first start as a leader, you first start getting promoted, you first start getting into these high level leadership positions, trying to find the balance between what is best for the people and the culture and achieving the mission, sometimes they clash quite a lot. And that's why I'm really seeing a lot of differences in the leaders of the world. We have leaders saying, my people are the most important. I don't want anyone to die. I don't really care what happens to the economy, so long as we're safe. Then I have other people for more of a military mindset or a corporate mercenary mindset. I don't care how many people die, so long as our economy remains strong. The balance between people and keeping your people safe and happy and the mission, being very cognizant, I'm talking to, to people that are in Asia, Business has always come first. And don't try and tell me that people come first in Asian business. They don't. Business comes first. Revenue comes first. Profit comes first. Now we're learning for these startups and this change in culture. That's by looking after your people. Because we hit a big wall in AI. The AI programmers have stopped at a certain point because they can't program artificial intelligence to react emotionally because the programmers don't have EQ. They have IQ. So how do you balance what's best for your people and the mission? That's where the loneliness of leadership comes from. If you are appointed as a leader, you're going to have KPIs and a mission to achieve. And that comes before your people. In the military and live operations, we will sacrifice as many people as it takes to meet the objective. But our culture is that's the price that's required and we're willing to pay it for each other. In corporate, it's different. And now with COVID-19, the stakes are life and death. So how do you balance what's best for your people and the mission? Simple. Look after your people first. I'll make it easy for you. I'll tell you exactly what to do. Look after your people. Make sure they're safe and you show them that you care. Even if you have to cut them away, even if you have to stand them down, put them on extended leave, or even fire them because you can't survive as a business, do your best to look after your people. Crisis leadership is about strategy. It's about the long game, especially when you get into these phases, you'll understand what I'm saying. And after a while, the higher you go up in leadership, it's not about balancing anymore, it's about harmony. Instead of looking at these two different things, you'll see them as cogs, that if you put them together the right way, the machine spins the way you want it to spin. But I want to acknowledge that people are struggling right now, trying to do what's right for their people and keep their business going. Look after your people and they will look after your business. All right. So when it comes to people, take a deep breath, all right? When it comes to people, I came up with a concept which is called the VIP of mental health. I'm gonna give you a short overview so you understand the fundamentals. And if you go to DionJensen.com, the book and the workbook is available to download for free. So you can go through this later. But basically it's a relationship between value, identity and purpose. Everything right now in crisis, fear will attack your people's value. People get their value from who they are, their identity, or what they do. And within the value triangle, it breaks down again into your core values and your currency. Now, so how many people have lost financial value right now? They're not working. How many people have lost that core value? I'm a husband and a father. What if I can't work? What if I can't provide for my family? Then my personal currency is depleted. My financial currency is depleted. My core value is attacked. The value part of my triangle is already starting to fall to pieces. And now I've got nothing to do. So everything that we do in crisis leadership is about raising people's value up. And I'll show you ways that you can do this uh, when we get into the mission. So you need to understand the VIP of mental health. And when we talk about mental health, I'm talking about the mindset as a leader. You've got to lock this down for yourself before you can lead someone else. So you've got to keep focus of your mind. And you know all this monkey thoughts are going to come and all this crisis is going to try and shift your focus. So what I do as a leader, my daily routine as a leader is to wake up and be grateful and do my four, four, and four breathing. I breathe in for four seconds. I hold for four seconds. I breathe out for four seconds. I do it four times. And I become a rock to myself. Then I start thinking about what needs to be done. I check how that feels. And I make a plan of what I'm supposed to do. And then I'll do that exactly the same from my people's point of view. If I tell them to do this, 
What are they going to think? How's it going to make them feel? Are they going to do it? Because you must give your people value. Why? Because they're your people. If you say to them, Darren, no matter what happens, I'm going to stick with you and your family until we can figure this out. We may go out of business, we may not, but we're going to stay in your corner. We're going to do the best that we can because you're important to us. You've got to keep that value up. When someone gets suicidal, and what's really interesting, I'm dealing with vulnerable and suicidal civilians more at the moment because I've never dealt with the scale of fear before. It came fast. It came out of nowhere. Then all of a sudden, they had no control. Someone else is controlling their life. So all those cracks in that value are coming now. I'm nothing. I'm just a number. How can you just stop this? I've got mortgages to pay. My superannuation has gone. So everyone's value is getting attacked. So as a leader, if you want to keep that strong mental health, lock your own mental health down is about your mindset, your focus. What are you looking at? What are you listening to? What are you saying? This is all happening up here in our head. That's why it's called headquarters. This is where all the decisions are made. And the effects and the emotional compass will let us know how that feels. So it's focus and mindset that you have to lock down. I know a glitch. Excuse me for one moment. Technology. Here we go. This was the bit I said that some of you at the 30 minute mark will be thinking, wow, I was coming on a webinar to learn what to do in crisis. And this guy is just yabbered on about all these different things. He's just given us all this information. I just want to know what to do. If anyone feels like that, it's okay. It's intentional. Because that's exactly what just happened to your people. This crisis river called COVID-19 came washing down and it swept a whole lot of people away. As a result of that, a whole lot of people who did not ask your professional or personal opinion made a whole lot of decisions that now control your life. You're not allowed to go outside unless this. You can't go anywhere unless this. Your control of your life has been taken away by this crisis. You've lost control. You don't have control. So the government will decide and law enforcement will decide what we do next. That's the world we live in. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just what it is at the moment. So just like I've talked all this information at you, those that are thinking about what I'm saying will think about it. Those that are feeling what I'm saying, they'll feel it. But there'll be a group of you now that want to know exactly what to do. And that's when we need a mission. What I was talking about was the whole background. Understanding fear. Understanding that in the military, crisis is good fun for us. Because fear is a friend and we know exactly what to do. We've got systems and processes. In the corporate world, we have the same, but we don't have any systems or processes that take care of our mental health in the middle of crisis in corporate. Because it was never important because it was always about profit. We started looking at wellness, and wellness is different. This is about the mental focus. This is about mental health, value, identity, and purpose. So what do we actually do? We have three phases for crisis leadership. You can take a deep breath now because these are just all instructions, and I'll give you this ebook afterwards. There are three phases in crisis leadership. They are phase one, survival. What do we do just to survive? Stage two is regaining the initiative and having a backup plan for your lighting if there's a power cut. Phase three is taking advantage of this crisis so that you're not caught unawares again. So let's go into survival. The priority in phase one of survival is safety. Safety and better in your position. And in phase one of survival or crisis leadership, your number one skill is controlling focus. Because remember, we have the river, the rock, and the eagles. The river is the crisis that's going to take your focus. You have to be that rock. So these are the 10 steps. Step number one, phase 1.1, be the rock in the river. Phase 1.2, you've got to use the river's energy to redirect focus back to you. Phase 
sorry, 1.3, is you must keep the river in context. When we're in fear mode, we have tunnel vision. We have auditory exclusion. We're just going to watch what scares us, not going to hear anything else unless it relates to that. We've got to put the river in context. Yes, I know right now that COVID-19 has us locked down. I also know that the government has a, uh, a support package that goes for 12 weeks. So I'm picking that something's going to happen at the 12 week mark. What else is going good at the moment? We have to widen the context to break out of that tunnel vision. Phase 1.4, look for the jewels of opportunity. This river's just come down and washed out what was here. There's lots of jewels of opportunity. Everyone's madly trying to get online now and put their systems online. And we are now on the first ever New Zealand Chamber of Commerce Singapore webinar. So that is an advantage now for if the crisis comes down again. We know how to self-isolate. We know how to keep business running online. That's a jewel. 1.5, empower your people to get ready to cross the river. The first thing that I want to do once we're all under control and safe is I want to get across this river. Why? Because if I get across that river before everyone else, that is all green fields for me. While everyone else is looking at the river, I'm already, my eagles are gone. And I'm looking for the next ground to get across. But you've got to empower your people through training. Put them through the VIP of mental health course so that they can lock down their own mental health. Put them through a crisis leadership course. Get them on an online course. Get them the information, but have it facilitated by someone that knows about crisis leadership. Get them ready. Start talking about where are the next opportunities? What can we chase up now? Because there's not many people in the marketplace that are marketing and they're doing something wrong. They're trying to sell at the moment. We'll talk about that later. Phase 1.6, you've got to rehearse. In four weeks' time, we're going to be talking to new clients in this country, in this industry. Start wargaming that now. Start having those conversations now. Start building those procedures now. Why aren't we doing our back-to-work procedures right now? Because everyone's trying to figure out what's going on. Don't wait for that. If we have to put everyone back to work in four weeks' time, are we ready to go? What's our back-to-work procedures? What's our screening process? Who's doing our assessment? Start building for the future now. Phase 1.7, you've got to get in close to a few people. If you haven't grabbed all your people now, pull them in close, show them that you care, put a plan in place, start on empowering them, get in close. Because the next step is you're going to ask them to cross this river that has just scared everybody and get across the river, which is phase 1.8, which is take the leap, get across the river. Phase 1.9 is you've got to keep oversight. The moment you ask your people to go and do something, you've got to have eyes on them. Because as you move, gaps will appear. Now, this is the great thing I like about crisis, crisis leadership, is why there's a whole bunch of people running around with their heads cut off like chickens. All these gaps are opening that anyone can run through right now and get an advantage if they do it right. But keep oversight because in those gaps, your people can fall into. If you don't have a checkup system for your employees right now that you are not checking with them at least once every couple of days to make sure that they're okay, then they're not going to be ready to come when you call. So make sure they're okay. But please, with boundaries, here's a don't. Don't assume because you're the leader that you have the right to walk into your employee's house anytime you feel like it, just because we're working remotely. Try and keep business hours. I wouldn't let my boss, if I was working on another contract, walk into my house at 8 o'clock in the evening when I'm trying to have dinner with my kids. That doesn't give you the excuse to then go, right, we're having a meeting, 20, 100 hours, get on a Zoom call. No, respect the boundary of the home. Mixing up the home and the workplace, working remotely, you have to be very careful. And then the last uh, step for phase one, 1 1.10, is you've got to check, check, and recheck everything as it's moving. Don't stop checking. So I hope that helps for phase one for survival. If you do this, you're going to be pre-positioned to get across that river. Right, phase two is regaining the initiative. I'm going to pick that a lot of people on this webinar in the audience have already survived because you're still here. or You've got one month left of salary, maybe two or three. The average is three months of salary. So you're either, yep, the only survived, we're doing okay. How do we now position to take advantage, which is phase three? So phase two is regaining the initiative. Our outcomes are positioning and selecting the best ground. Our key leadership skill is strategic vision. Was keeping the focus to keep our people together, get them across the river. Now it's strategic vision. We are across the river. We need to set up dominate that ground and be ready to go. So phase two, regaining the initiative, step one. Phase 2.1, secure the ground, claim the territory. I'm an inspirational goal speaker with over a million views. I do well at speaking, I do well at training. 
Slight alteration, I secured the ground as a virtual speaker in regards to crisis leadership. Today, right now, 16th of April 2020, is day 2.10 in my strategy. So this is day 20 for me. I've got 10 more days to go to get out the other side. I secured my ground. I'm speaking on crisis leadership virtually. I can run virtual workshops and events. No different than physically. But there's not many other people out here promoting themselves that way. I'm securing that ground. 2.2, get operational. Set up temporary systems and processes. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be pretty. I'm sitting in my lounge. I have two lamps in case there's a power cut and something falls out. I've got two phones and two laptops. Is it the best? No. Is the light in the best? No. Is the message still going to get out? Yes. In 12 months' time, when this is all running physically and people look back, who was talking about it at that time? So you'll see me do some 2021 posts soon where I talk about the future as the past and what we did well and what we didn't. Because I'm not going to wait. I'm going to get out there and secure the ground and get operational. Then I'm going to send those eagles out. I'm going to send my scouts out. I'm going to do reconnaissance. And I'm going to check out the new environment. What's out there at the moment? What hasn't changed? Like everyone's looking for these opportunities that we then can do now. What hasn't changed? I'll tell you what hasn't changed. People are still using fuel. People are still drinking alcohol. People are still smoking cigarettes. People are still doing certain things within. People are still using toilet paper. There's things that are still going on. Look for what is still going. Look for those industries that the river didn't affect or they actually amplified. Those industries that the river actually floated their boats and off they went. And then once you get all the information back, sit down with your team and strategize. Page 2.4. Do your SWOT analysis, but do it as a team. Now, I'm going to apologize in advance. Everything I do is bold. I'm a lion. I'm used to crisis. But I do also understand that this I can insult and I don't mean to. When you strategize as a team, put the right people in the room. There is a complex that we call the hero complex in crisis, where some of the leaders just want to be on TV. Some of those leaders want to be the ones that are riding the white horse that come galloping over the hill with the reinforcements and they are not qualified or experienced to make those decisions. Get the right people in the room. How do you choose the right people? Put the people in the room that your decisions are going to affect. Let me say that again. When you're planning and strategizing new information, I put my whole team in the room so I want everyone's perspective. But if you're being selective, pick the people who are going to be affected by your decisions, not just the heads of department. I don't want to turn around and say, uh, Dion, you're leading the, um, the marketing team. I need your feedback on this information. What do you think? Bring the whole marketing team in. Get everyone's perspective because the decisions are going to affect them. Then you're going to build and expand or you're going to move to better ground. Now, coming back to Sun Tzu, he's got nine types of ground that give an advantage as a commander. And one of the most uh, advantageous grounds is called the ground of intersecting highways. If you can secure ground that a whole lot of people have to come through and you control that, you're going to dominate most of the empire, according to him. But in order to do that, you need allies. So as we get into phase, at the end of phase two, begin of phase three, we start partnering with people and start growing. So phase 2.7, put sentries out. Do not get complacent. You have now got new ground. You're now being a leader. You're now standing up. You have now become a threat in someone else's SWOT analysis. This is still battleground. So make sure you've got sentries out. You've got early warning for threats and opportunities. But do not relax yet. You're not there yet. And then once you've chosen your ground, you started to build, you've got your sentries out, then you broadcast. That's when you broadcast your expertise, your position, and your call to action. I look where the river went. I took my team across the river early. I set up ground for crisis response and virtual um, products and services. And then once we were locked down, once our procedures were in place, once we war game, then we played the enemy against each other, then we broadcast. Centuries are out. So now we're broadcast. You want to talk about crisis leadership, mental health, or human strategy? I'm happy to talk to you. Then you need to guide others across the river, phase 2.9. Guide other people across the river. People out there are terrified they're lost. Help them get across. Do not charge them. Get them to safety and meet their needs. And in phase 2.10, you need to partner. That's today. So today I'm partnering with a lot of other speakers and trainers, and we're doing a whole lot of things together. We're securing contracts now. We've had uh, offers, three-year contracts to train people in crisis leadership. Why? 
because there's no one else talking about it. And when you go into our LinkedIn profiles, we've, we've led there before. But we put all of these other phases in place first. Finish phase one. Phase two is happening between us right now, but we're already at the end of phase four, my people. We're going to get a phase three today. Then after we get through phase two, we get into phase three. Now, this is my favorite phase because I like to win. But please let me qualify what taking advantage means. You take advantage of the situation, not the people. Don't ever sell a solution to fear to people that are in fear. Or you'll make some sales and you'll make some money. Just like people marking up face masks and hand sanitizer and toilet paper and flour. Flour was $1.79 with a lot of baking at home. Now it's like $3 something. Ridiculous. I remember, and I will remember those supermarkets that did that, and I won't shop there. And if you try and sell me on something that you know I need because I'm in pain, that will come back and bite you later. So phase three, taking advantage. The outcome is own the ground. You've got to have ownership and authority of the ground that you're in. And you've got to control access to that new ground. Own it. You're the leader. Stand up and lead. Stake it in the ground. So your key leadership skill is going to be strategic partnership. You're going to need allies. We've had this river come through. We've got across. It's new ground. There's still danger out there. And there's strength in numbers. The right numbers. Allies, as Sanzo would say. So phase three. Last phase. Stick with me. We've got 13 minutes to go. This is how you take advantage of crisis. Phase 3.1, maintain authority. This is your territory. I will defend this space that I'm speaking about crisis leadership from my perspective. I'm not saying I'm better than anyone else. I just say my perspective has a full system behind it. Phase 3.2, showcase your adapted products and services. Still not selling yet. Just showcase what you can do. Hey, guys, if anyone's scared about crisis leadership, I'm happy to come and talk. I've got a couple of free ebooks. Grab the VIP of mental health. The good news about PTSD, grab to help people. But showcase how you've adapted. Hey, we're doing Zoom calls now. The, uh, the Lion Academy is up and running. If anyone has access to this, so it's the same stuff that you're trusted for, but it's now been adapted. Yes, I know you're worried about this. Um, here's an example. Uh, a friend of mine who's on this call was a managing director of a group of companies who I will interview uh, tomorrow. He secured one of the biggest contracts he's ever got because he's showed how he's adapted what he's always done for people. And he's the only one in that space. So phase 3.3 is my absolute favorite. So now we can get all businessy. Phase 3.3, you establish the new value of your products and services because it's a new market. It's new ground. People are coming across the river. They want to come to the ground where you are. You define the value. For example, I get paid uh, 10,000 US dollars to speak for 45 minutes. That was my rate for last year. But if the content is more specific for the speed, the stakes, and the scale, I'll put that value up. Because you can now get out there and compete because you own this ground. So we've come through survival, we've come through positioning. Now let's take advantage. Let's get out there. It's a business, it's a competition. You can get out there and compete. You can get out there and fight. So if anyone thinks it was quite tree huggy and look after people, once that's all done, we've got work to do. We need to increase our engagement, our productivity, and our revenue and get out the front. And there's only three ways that you succeed in business if you want to look at it from a holistic point of view. You're either the best in market, you're operationally efficient, or it's customer intimacy. Those are the main three. For me, it's customer intimacy. I've been the person that needs what I have. So I'm very intimate with that particular customer because that customer was me. And I love operational efficiency. I'm not trying to be best in market. I'm trying to connect with my customers and be operationally efficient. And my operational efficiency is understanding these phases, understanding ground, and understanding how to choose my own value. And you're allowed to, because if you don't, Someone else will. If you don't control that, someone else will. Phase 3.4, knock yourself out, serve and sell. Sell to your heart's, con uh, your heart's content. You've helped people across the river. You've met their needs. You've positioned your partners. And now you can go out there and serve and sell to your heart's content. No one's going to see you as someone trying to take advantage of people. You've taken advantage of the situation. And then phase 3.5, 
Uh, five is just something that I do. Track and report on customers' performance because I'm always looking for talent. If someone buys one of my programs, does really, really well on one of my programs, I want him as an instructor or I want her as an instructor. So your customers could become your employees. There's a whole lot of people that are out of work at the moment. I'd be looking for talent and recruiting <laughs> while you can. Start looking at people now. And then after you identify talent, I'm looking for potential JV partners. So I've already JV partnered with uh, someone in Singapore who's got a trainers platform and a learning management system platform. I get approached all the time with startup companies because they need a speaker or a trainer to come and try out all this. I'm looking for JV partners. Why? Because I'm positioned now. And then I'm diversifying. And I'm very, very lucky. My dad and I did this two years ago. Uh, we both have high-level security risk management investigation backgrounds. My heart is towards empowering people. But what we did was we got involved with fuel technology because we knew that everyone uses fuel. And my plan for 2020 was to run corporate retreats. But I want them to be eco-retreats. So on clean fuel, clean water, and clean power. So solar, eco-toilets, um, solar technology has water now on clean fuel. So my father and I can save 4% on anyone's fuel costs now. And I have sole distributorship rights of Papua New Guinea, Bougainville, and my father's doing it in the Philippines. Totally outside of our expertise, but we're operationally efficient. So we've diversified. The diversified doesn't always mean invest, uh, investing in portfolios. It's also investing in skills industry. And that's what we did. And then send the eagles again. 3.9, send the eagles out. You've come across the river, you set up new ground, you're growing, you've got that big lighthouse pumping out all that light, people are coming to you, the business is growing, send the eagles out again. Get them out further, keep the vision going, keep it going and going. Because phase 3.10, watch that river. Because what we know about the crisis river is it is always flowing. If you do these three phases, when the next crisis comes along, you'll be sitting like we're sitting right now where we want crisis to come down the river because we recognize what it is and what it does and that people be operating under fear. So if I could finish off with an overarching summary, very short one. Understand your relationship with fear. Understand what you fear. And then understand your people's relationship with fear and what they fear. And then be the rock in that river of fear, in that river of crisis, and say, I'm not afraid, I know exactly what to do. Or if you are afraid, you can say, I'm afraid too, but this is what we're going to do. Don't devalue those that are terrified by this if you're not. And don't go on about conspiracy theories to someone who's just lost their grandmother who has died in the rest home. Managing yourself means you can lead yourself. And then you can lead others. Focus on the mental health of your people. Understand the VIP of mental health concept. And at the end of this, I'll answer any of your questions. And then we'll email how you can get access to all of these things. I'm not selling anything. We are at phase 2.10 as of right now. So I will not sell anyone on this call anything at this phase. I'll help you get the information you need to help get your people safe. If you want me to come on and talk online, I'll go and do that. But once you're safe, and you're operational, I will show you everything that I have. And you'll be fine with that because we looked after the relationship first. So if you want to look after anything in your business, look after your people. Bring them all in. Get the ideas from them. Do not be afraid of crisis because no one's talking about the bushfires in Australia now, are they? In the six months' time, we might not be talking about COVID-19. It might be COVID-24 by then. The content and the context is irrelevant. The river of crisis is going to keep flowing. Get the skills so you can survive, you can regain the initiative, and then you can take advantage. Thank you very much. Over to you, Rachel. Thanks, Dion. What an um, insightful talk. There are just a couple of questions, and then if anyone else has questions, please use the Q&A button down the bottom of your screen. We do have a couple of minutes that Dion can answer them. Um, the first one here is, what would your advice be um, for small businesses where there may be only one or two people, um, owners, directors, having to lead and, and, and do the do in the business as well? All right, so broad question. Um, we can get specifics of that. 
firstly, what industry is the business? Uh, what is your baseline revenue to survive? Um, what are your fears at the moment in regards to yourself and your business? Who can you then partner with? If you don't have the money, barter. Barter products and services, ban up with people and survive from there. But without knowing what your objectives and your outcomes and your in uh, industry are, very, very hard to give you advice. But quite happy to contact me after this and have a discussion, no charge. Happy to provide any advice to steer people the right way. Cool. And another one here, you, you spoke a little bit about media at the start of um, your talk. What would your advice be to people? Would you be advising people that, they, that leaders don't read the media or advising their teams not to read media or social media in a crisis? What's no, your thought? No, I mean, you don't want to shut down any, any type of access to media. You want to actually have access to that, but control the context of it. Um, I'm hoping that Paddy Gower will see this. I, I'm a huge fan of Paddy Gower because he's just, He's just straight down the line, right? If you listen to only one media source, you only get one perspective. I am really enjoying seeing who is connected to who right now. I can see a message come out somewhere about um, ventilators uh, and masks, and I, then I can see the same thing from our Prime Minister on TV, and I can see it over on social media. So it's important as leaders to be across what the different messages are and understanding what media are your people looking at. I watch the news here in New Zealand, so then I know what my people are looking at if they're in New Zealand, but I'm keeping a contextual view and leading that. And then I always have a communication with my people to say, look, if you see or hear anything on the media that scares you or think we should know about, let us know and we'll discuss it. But the moment you try and shut down access to media, and funny, from a military perspective, and Colonel McMillan will back me up on this one, if you want to take over a country, if you want to invade, first thing to do is shut down media. Shut them down, shut down their communication. I would rather have an open communication channel that I can monitor and provide context to because phase 1.2 is using the river's focus uh, energy to bring focus back to yourself there's actually free energy um, if it's something you really disagree with that's the only time you're going to get stuck um, if media comes out and says hey listen the best thing that you can do right now is eat chicken soup then you'd be wanting to put that in balance so no I wouldn't recommend that you tell people not to to listen to media I, I would be aware of what they watch and keep it in context and use that energy to keep it balanced. Um, otherwise, you'll devalue someone's opinion uh, and you want to, no, short answer. Okay. Um, we've got another question here. Um, when you've had to let some people go due to crisis, what's your advice around managing the fear that the rest of the team, so the people who are left, have about that, that they might be the next ones? Be open, 100% open. Uh, I contract. So I will take a contract um, where I've, I've got a particular contract and at the moment it's mental health. So I keep my hands on the front line, but I know I'm a contract at any stage, contract will finish, I could carry on and I do my own business as well. So I've always got a balance there. When I was contract as regional operations manager, we had to get rid of people because be totally honest, give people as much notice as you can, be totally transparent, it's a business, but you don't have to treat people like a number. So if you just let people go, I would be calling in a meeting, say, guys, yes, we had to let uh, Jim and Mary go because we can't afford the salaries and there's not enough revenue coming in from their department that's business. I know some of you are worried right now. Um, and if at any stage it gets to that point, we will let you know. You have my word that I'm not going to say nothing. Clear, constant communication, remember? Not, I'm not, not going to say nothing and then get rid of you. If it looks like it's going to get close to where you are, I will give you as much notice as I can and I will talk you through as much as as we can to help you through that but be honest and 100 percent transparent otherwise you'll ruin relationships and the last thing you want right now i'm looking how businesses are operating if you're really quiet then you just hatch at your people because you're too scared because that's what the fear is if you're too scared to let them know that you're thinking about firing them then you're not a very good leader um you've got to eat that fear for your people just be totally transparent and honest with them all righty. Now we've 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 hit one o'clock, which is um, the the end of our webinar here. So I'd just like to say, um, Dion, on behalf of the New Zealand Chamber here in Singapore, and everyone listening today, a huge thank you for your time, and and for the stories and the the insight that you had. What we'll do is we'll make um, your presentation today and the links to your books and your website available for everyone who attended. Um, and then I, I guess if anyone's got follow up questions for you, they can contact you um, through those channels as well. Yeah, absolutely. If you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. 
theonjensen.com has both books free to download. And if anyone is struggling at the moment uh, and is really lost, reach out to me directly. I'm not going to try and sell you anything yet, my word. So if you need help to get through these phases, I'll help you. And then once we're all operational, we'll have that discussion further down the track. Um, as soon as my current students are through a couple of the online courses, I will be making a, a discount code for the chamber um, where it's just a dollar access to get into that portal. So you can grab the crisis leadership course, you can grab the VIP of mental health and a real simple little course on how to build your LinkedIn profile and connect into other networks. Um, and that's a really good one to gift your people in the meantime. It's just say, hey, listen, things are going crazy. We don't really know what's going to happen next. But well, let's get you some skills in the meantime. It just costs you a dollar to get in there just to help. Great. Okay, thanks so much for your time. Oh, you're very welcome. Absolute pleasure. And stay safe. You too. Thanks. Bye.